Hello, everybody. My name is Shali Gupta Barnes, and I'm the policy director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary. The mission of the Cairo Center is to um, learn from, strengthen, and expand uh, transformative movements for social change in the world. Um, we, we draw on the power of religions and human rights to raise up generations of religious and community leaders committed to building the poor as a leading social force to build a broad movement to end poverty. We come out of a history of poor people's organizing in the United States and have connected with movements around the world to understand the moment of transition and crisis that we are in and the opportunities also that are, being, that are opening up today. We are here at the People's Forum in New York City with um, two, uh, two very prominent religious leaders and act social justice activists of our time and a, an important, the important scholarship um, that's coming out of Union Theological Seminary. Swamini Agnivesh is a Hindu religious leader and activist from India who founded the Bonded Labor Liberation Front in 1981 to help confront the slavery-like working conditions across India. He has fought tirelessly for the rights of the marginalized for nearly 40 years. And in 2004, he received the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. He's been in prison multiple times for his work and repeatedly attacked and threatened, but continues to this day to stand up and resist the forces that degrade and violate human life. Also with us is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, the director of the Cairo Center at Union, national co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, which historians have said is, has embarked on the largest wave of civil disobedience in, the la in this century in this country. With her roots in homeless and welfare organizing, she has been an anti-poverty activist for 25 years. She's also a biblical scholar and the author of Always With Us, What Jesus Really Said About the Poor. And finally, we have Professor John Tatamino, Associate Professor of Theology and World Religions at Union Theological Seminary. He's the author of The Imminent Divine, God, Creation, and the Human Predicament, an East-West Conversation, in which he compares and seeks to learn from the Hindu theologian Shankaracharya and the Christian theologian Paul Tillich. He's completing final revisions to his book, Circling the Elephant, Constructing Constructive Theology Through Interreligious Learning, and he is currently teaching a course on Hindu religious thought and practice at Union. He is also on the advisory board of our co-sponsor for this uh, interview today, Sadhna, the Organization of Progressive Hindus. So thank you all for being here um, for this conversation and for everyone who is here with us um, watching you know, and participating in this conversation today. Um, for those who may not be familiar with your histories, can you share how you came into your activism and scholarship and also the influence that your activism and scholarship has had on your understanding and practice of religion? In other words, how has your religious commitment informed your engagement in the world? And how has your work and engagement informed your religious beliefs? Can we start with Swamiji? Thank you very much, Shelley. And I'm really impressed whatever I've a little learned about this poor people's campaign and the work Caros has been doing. <clears throat> I find this question, I normally people ask me, how come that you are from a religious background, little orthodox background, and yet involved in activities which are unusual for a Swami to undertake? Now let me go back to a little history of my life. That's I was born into a very, very orthodox Brahmin family of South India, in Srikakulam, India. I was brought up by my maternal grandfather, who was deeply religious, a devout practicing Brahmin, worshipping gods and goddesses, set up a small temple room in the house. And as a little child, I would follow suit and worship all those gods and goddesses without understanding the metaphorical significance of any of these. And I took it for, you know, 
granted that yeah gods are like that goddesses are like that and they have to be pleased they have to be we have to chant their name this and that put flowers break coconuts and offer this and that in return they will bless us so <clears throat> sort of a quid pro quo relationship i had with my gods but i also practiced a bit of caste system because the farm labor in my grandfather's farms were mostly untouchables and at the in the evening when they would come back from the work and report about day's work i invariably found them standing outside of the courtyard never could they come near the house and they're all very very you know i mean exploited then i could see from their bodies how dark because working in the sun whole day taking care of our cattle everything and <clears throat> they had simply a loin cloth on their body <clears throat> and at the end of reporting i would be told they are very poor go and give it to them whatever left over food or clothes or something and i would as i would go i would be told don't touch them throw it at them and i would like a child ask why not what happens if i touch no we are brahmins and they are lower caste you are not supposed to touch them if you touch you have to take a shower change your clothes they are untouchables yes but they are growing food for us they are growing milk and everything for us no 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 just don't argue do it so in matters of religion i was not allowed to argue or question anything just follow so i would just go and throw it at them and rush back now this untouchability was not confined to those untouchable poor laborers i had lost my father at the age of 4 and first thing i would do returning from his school in the late afternoon would be go and sit in my mother's lap but every month i would be told those three days that you are not supposed to go to your mother i'll be crying amma amma say no don't go and touch her otherwise you will have to take a shower and change your clothes and why well this is our dharma religion and i would like to ask why is my uncle never an untouchable only my mother never my elder brother only my elder sister but no question similarly about god's goddesses so so much of superstition so many of other practices orthodoxy <clears throat> i grew up in that uh, till the age of 17 i completed my college school education and i went over to calcutta for my college education there i chanced upon the real bedrock foundation of hinduism all that i was practicing was something superficial something uh, distorted during medieval period perverted even and there when i came across this arya samaj as established by the great rebel swami dayanand saraswati he introduced us to the vedas and he opened the gates of the study of the vedas for the whole of human kind not just for brahmins so it was a revolutionary chapter of my life it started at the age of 17 18 and thereafter i started evolving within and i could then interact with other people also question some of these other practices here and there including my own family people so this way i grew into a sort of an activist not just confining to myself but trying to convince others change others about caste system about animal slaughter there were some temples in calcutta where they sacrifice goats in front of a kali temple kali goddess and i would be horrified to see that poor goat being cut <laughs> and all of those things you know slowly slowly i felt something is basically basically wrong the way we observe our religions and another aspect in calcutta you might have seen or <clears throat> read somewhere but the some of the streets are below sea level and if there is a rainfall then the streets get flooded and the poor people who have been pushing carts or even rickshaw whole day they have no place 
to rest except on the pavements and those pavements will be filled with water and these poor people will be holding their little baggage on their head and standing shivering whole night and I would ask myself why don't these religious places open their doors of course they are also children of the same God and I would be told by really no 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 they will pollute they will spoil this place will not can't allow them inside so what type of religion is this? And there will be big houses, bungalows, uh, half empty. And those rich people would not allow these poor inside. So why is this rich and poor divide? I didn't see the rich people working that hard. I saw the poor working that hard. All of these questions. And then I would be told the past life karma. Hmm? Actions of the past life are responsible for this life suffering, exploitation, etc. So trying to rationalize all of that in a really and I would say no no it couldn't be like that but I had no answers. Then I searched for answers more in the Vedas, Upanishads and other things and I found to my great pleasant surprise that it was all humbug, it was all manipulated, contrived, and therefore I just leapt in joy, say, Oh, the real message is there, but it has been completely distorted, perverted. So why not I do something about upholding the real message? So when I passed out from a university, I'm com LLB, and I started teaching in prestigious college called St. Javier's College, Calcutta, business management and law. These two subjects I used to teach and practice law at Calcutta High Court also. So around that time, I had a calling and that the country, our people need change. And the religions, not just the Hindu religion, Islam, Christianity, everything is holding them back. Hmm? You know, these whole army of priestly class all around. There are a few exceptions, like my friend John, but I'm talking about <coughs> general uh, army of uh, middlemen, those who are, you know, ever ever ready to mediate between the mortals and the God. You can't reach God directly. So they say, come through us. So, <clears throat> and they were forces of the status quo. And they were just opposed to what the Prophet has done. Each Prophet was for change, radical transformation. And no sooner the Prophet died or disappeared, that Prophet and his message was hijacked to make it into an institution, an organized church, something like that. Institution became more important, that organization became more important rather than implementing the message. So when I learned all of these things, I revolted and I said, the world needs something, something to go deeper into our religion and go into spirituality, which is common to all religions, the core spiritual values. but we are lost in rituals and dogmas and superstition, miracle mongering and everything. Turn religion into an industry, a mind-boggling billion dollar soul-saving industry. And uh, the people have been left out. And then around that time, I was teaching economic development. I was introduced to the philosophy of Karl Marx and other things and say, religion is like opium. And I could see, yes, there must be some truth behind it. But the poor have been given the religion and they have faith in their religion more than anything else, you know, the political philosophy that they can change. You know, they're born into lower caste, they're born in poor, it's something ordained by God, the Creator, the helpless. They have to suffer only the next life or birth, or there is a pie in the sky when they die, not in this life, something like. So, I, at every step, I started questioning, organized religions, institutionalized religions. And then <clears throat> this calling came, I left my job, my uh, practice in the high court and took another journey at the age of 28, 29 uh, towards the western part of India called Haryana on three sides of New Delhi and then I plunged into the liberation movement of the poor farmers, laborers, women, everybody. That was in 1968 beginning. 50 long years ago now. And there, while working among those poor, I tried to explore what the real message of the Vedas. 
the spiritual message for transformation. What is the concept of God? Does God, uh, I mean, create a, a society of rich and poor, male and female inequality, or high caste or low caste, or all of these man-made? You know, and I found them each of the inequality, discriminatory practices were all man-made, all man-made, including religions. You see, God doesn't make Hindu-Muslim religion. We make it. And we use it. So, uh, that's how I evolved. I'm sorry I took that long, but... <laughs> uh, but that's the truth about my evolution. I still continue to evolve. It's now not stopped. <laughs> Reflecting, evolving, inner <coughs> evolution and transformation. But I put into practice whatever I find my today's truth may be different from my tomorrow's truth, but then I keep on practicing. Thank you, Swamiji. Reverend Liz. Great. So, um, thank you. it's really good to be here with everyone. Um, it's a great honor to be in dialogue with Swamiji and with Professor Tantamano. And thanks to Sadhana for, for making this all happen. Um, so I was raised um, to see that practicing my faith and doing the work of social justice was, was instricably linked. Um, I was uh, taught from a very early age, uh, Micah 6.8, what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God, that it wasn't possible to honor and worship God without uh, working for justice in the world and the here and now. Um, and so I was exposed at a young age to lots of folks from different faith traditions around the world who were engaged in, in social justice struggles, whether it was Palestine or South Africa, whether it was um, you know, uh, El Salvador, or Cuba. Um, and so from a very young age, I, I, I knew that there were people out there in the world who were motivated to build a movement for justice globally, um, but motivated by their, their and our faith traditions. And I was very involved in my church growing up and in interfaith organizing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was raised. Um, you know, church was my second home. Uh, I had a little bag where I brought my Winnie the Pooh toys and played while, you know, we had meetings. Um, I was a Sunday school teacher by the age of 13. I was a deacon by the age of 16. Um, this is, you know, I was raised, but the whole time, you know, thinking that my work trying to bring God's kingdom here to earth was, was about making sure that people were fed and housed and had living wage jobs and weren't racially discriminated against and, and um, had the freedom to practice their faith beliefs. Um, when I was introduced to the National Union of the Homeless in the mid-1990s, um, I started to see what was also present in, in the Wisconsin community I was raised in, but how strong the kind of religious opposition was to the cause of justice. Um, and so you know, in, in your introduction, Shali, you said that I've spent the tw past 25 years doing very grassroots anti-poverty organizing, and, and there's basically not a week in my life in those 25 years um, uh, where somebody doesn't say, well, you know, the poor will be with you always, mm -hmm. to justify poverty and in action in the face of poverty, and to say if God wanted to end poverty, he would do so. Um, you know, I, I started doing welfare rights organizing in the 1990s before the 1996 um, welfare reform law, um, you know, a structural adjustment program in the United States, um, much like structural adjustment programs that were happening all across the world uh, as neoliberalism was kind of wreaking havoc. And, um, you know, I was introduced when we were talking about the issue of welfare and welfare rights um, to to passages in the Bible that, that folks around me had never heard of before, but like First Thessalonians where um, it's if you do not work, you shall not eat. Uh, the preamble to the, the 1996 welfare reform law is one of the most moralistic documents in, in law. Um, and, it, and, and so I started to see in my organizing 
um, how how this kind of religious nationalism, this Christian nationalism in particular, in, in, in the context that I was working in, was really rearing its head. Um, and so while I was raised with this kind of, uh, you know, belief in social justice and, and doing the work of, of, you know, meeting people's needs and organizing society around the needs of everyone as, as something that was very biblically, very religiously based, and not just in Christianity, but that's what I was raised in and that's what I knew. Um, I, I started to see how much opposition to that notion there really was. Um, and, and that opposition didn't just come from people that would be considered conservative or right wing. Um, it, was, it was also coming from, from folks that were self-professed progressives and liberals. Um, but, but still at the base of their understanding of, of faith traditions and of Christianity and of the Bible in particular was in the inevitability of poverty um, and in the kind of notion that poor people are sinners um, and have sinned against God and that's why we're in the predicament that we're in and not that poverty is a sin against God and that could and should be ended. And so, you know, I've spent much of the last 25 years of my life not without difficulty. Um, you know, it took me more than 20, 12 years to be ordained in, in the Presbyterian Church, basically because uh, folks thought it was nice that we were talking about poverty. But, but the notion that you could end poverty and the notion that, that um, the God actually hates poverty and wants to end poverty, um, as is written in the Bible, uh, was very challenging to many of our, you know, mainline religious traditions, and as well as evangelical and, and others. Um, and so, so if that kind of that battle of theology has 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 shown itself, you know, in in my life and in my work and my ministry, you know, for the past decades. Um, and I think it shows itself in lots of different ways across the world. Mm -hmm. I'm honored to be um, on stage with these two eminent people. I'm the odd duck here. I, <clears throat> I live in the safety of my office and the classroom. And the classroom can, can be uh, challenging, of course. Um, but uh, usually, I can be relatively certain that um, far-right forces won't beat me up. Uh, so um, these two confront challenges that you know, far, and far and away exceed what I'm, um, what I'm customarily faced with. Um, so uh, they're there for me, role models, and um, so it's an honor to be here. Um, my own journey um, to scholarship that does care passionately about social justice, I think began with uh, my own Indian Christian tradition. I'm a member by birth of the Martoma uh, tradition, and one of the luminaries, theological luminaries of that tradition was M.M. M. Thomas, who uh, was very early on deeply committed to questions of social justice. And in my youth, um, one of my pastors, maybe in my early teens, was doing his PhD at Union Theological Seminary, uh, writing a dissertation on M.M. M. Thomas and preaching it at my church. So the legacy of M.M. M. Thomas and Union Theological Seminary was part of my childhood diet. Um, like Liz, I came from a tradition in which at least some young people are invited rather early to assume responsibilities for the religious life of the community. And so, yes, I was preaching pretty early. Uh, and I still remember that my dad would always say, you know, there in his proper um, combination of another kind of evangelicalism than the one that passes for evangelicalism today. He would always say, you know, when you preach, you have to have something like, something like an altar call, but you must also say something about social justice. Hmm. That's some, you know, what a blessing to have a father who, hmm. who says both of those things must be part of your mm -hmm. um, sermon. Everyone, every one of them. So that kind of early uh, infusion of commitment to justice 
was mediated to me, both by my church and by my family. And I think that accounts for the, the tenor of much of my work. But it became clear to me, through my mentors in graduate school, that they, they really thought that my primary gifts were scholarly. Uh, they didn't dissuade me from ordination, uh, which was where I was headed, but they gave me to understand that I really needed to do the, the work of deep thinking and writing. And for me, that meant the work of integration. Growing up as a young Indian immigrant who came to the US when I was nine, actually a little under nine, I had to find out what it meant to be Indian. And for me, that question was never sufficiently answered by my own Indian Christian tradition. It could have been, but I, I developed an early fascination and love for um, Hindu traditions, and particularly an attraction to Advaita Vedanta, which I then followed all the way to doing studies in, um, in the classroom, but also in Chennai with uh, my guru, uh, Swami Paramarthananda, in Chennai. And, uh, and so now my work intellectually is often about the integration of wisdom from Hindu and Christian traditions. But increasingly, I'm also asking questions that Swamiji has been asking for a long time. How did we come to think of religion in the ways that we have, um, that seek to privatize religion and, and mark it off from the political space. What configurations led to that? And how does that lead to a certain kind of domestication of religion? So we'll talk about those things, I know. But um, so now my scholarship is also not merely about ontology, <laughs> about being and tatwamasi and so forth. It's also about trying to mobilize the intellectual resources that I've been uh, granted and gifted to do the deep thinking that will lead to social transformation as well. Yes, these are um, the very questions that we want to raise with everyone uh, today and continue to have this conversation on this relationship um, between what's happening in the world, um, how power is shifting and changing, and what is the role of religion and faith in being able to, um, you know, both positive and negative kind of move us towards a better society or actually move us towards more fear and division and, and hatred. Um, and so we know we're in a time of crisis where crises are breaking out all over the world, um, this crisis of inequality, where just 42 people hold the same amount of wealth as 3.7 billion people. Um, and this is replicated in poor and wealthy countries alike. In the, in the US, just three people own as much wealth as 164 million people, the bottom half of the country, just three people. That's in the US. This is in the US, yes. And according to the research from the Poor People's Campaign, we found that 140 million people in the US are poor or low income, they're just living one emergency away from, from severe economic crisis. But in India, with this incredible kind of economic growth, you have 100 uh, billionaires at the same time that the global hunger index is, is saying that one in five of its children are malnourished. They're dollar bil billionaire. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, then there's land and resource scarcity. There's dramatic climatic events. And the response from elected officials and political parties and religious institutions from the US to India and everywhere in between is often to foster division and fear among the poor, um, whether it's along racial lines as it, is, as it is often in the United States or caste and religion or tribal identity in India and elsewhere around the world. But it's to systematically inflict oppressive inequalities in basic human dignity. And then when conflicts arise, because conflicts do arise, wherever there is oppression, there's resistance. But when conflicts arise, the response of these institutions that hold power is to impose either a show of strength and violence, as we're seeing in South Africa and Brazil and India and elsewhere, or often, just as often, it's to show a distance, a removal, or an abdication of responsibility, which ends up feeding those extremist and violent antagonisms <clears throat> that are quickly tearing us apart. 
So Swamiji, as someone, you know, you've not only been threatened, but in fact attacked politically, ideologically, physically by some of these forces, um, including conservative Hindus who've attempted to silence you in parliament as well. You know, you, you also talk about, you know, the importance of resisting the politics of fear, how it's important as Hindus and the responsibility of all Hindus. And I, I would, I think you would mean people of all faith or of no faith even to resist the politics of fear. What, what does that look like? What does that, how does that kind of, where are you seeing this happen? What does that resistance look like? And, and how can we prepare ourselves to be engaging in that? <clears throat> See, what I find today is this BJP and their cultural wing called RSS. Mm. They have completely hijacked the real message of the Hindus, the authentic message. Authentic message is Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, the whole world is one family. One God, one universe, one human family. No place for caste system or any discrimination by birth. It's all for gender equality and uh, no communal divide also. We are all hu human beings equal. That's the central message of the Vedas, Upanishads and all of the great rishis of the past. But they have completely distorted it and made it into suit their own political agenda, polarizing the Hindus mm -hmm. as against Muslims and against Christians, two big minorities in our country. And they're using it to the hilt, to the maximum, to benefit out of it. Not that there was no communal divide in earlier politics in India. The Congress party and other parties also used the caste divide and other things, but not as vehemently and as deviously as this present regime is doing. They are killing, lynching, Muslim young men on false charges or just suspicion of cow smuggling or beef eating and this and that. And then no one ever been punished. They are rather getting a hero's welcome once they come out on bail. And they are assured of bail beforehand. Go ahead, do all of these things. It has been caught on sting operation by NDTV. All of these things are there. So what I'm saying is this political dispensation right today is out to destroy the basic fundamental beauty, integrity and universality of Hinduism. And that they are doing more harm to the Hindus than to the Muslims. They might be killing a few Muslims here and there or Christians, but basically they are destroying our ancient most civilization, culture, spiritual heritage. That's the danger we run into. And there is no talk of social justice, absolutely. They are endorsing caste system. They are preventing women from going to Sabrimala temple with their equal right to worship. The president of the BJP, Amit Shah himself, is uh, going against the Supreme Court of India. And the Supreme <coughs> Court has no right to interfere with our religious practices. And then another Swami, Swami Sandeepanand Giri, who has been campaigning for women's equality to worship in that Ayyappa temple. His uh, Gita Ashram in Trivendram was vandalized, set on fire, everything happened just last uh, 10 days ago, 29th of uh, October. No, it's not just me huh, who they are attacking. They are attacking each one of us who is a moderate, liberal, inclusive. They find us to be dangerous and more particularly because we stand with the poorest of the poor. I was first attacked in Pakud in Jharkhand state which is predominantly tribal state and there I had gone at the invitation of 150,000 poorest of the poor tribals mm -hmm. that means indigenous people and to talk to them about their inalienable land rights and land right means mineral rights, forest rights everything. And it has been promised to them in Indian constitution. And I was just going to explain to them that constitution has empowered you. Just go by the constitution. You don't have to pick up arms and fight. You just go by what the law has given you. But I was not allowed to go. Just as I stepped outside of the press conference in that uh, hotel, I was pounced upon and I was beaten up. They just wanted to kill me, but by God's grace, 
I'm, I've survived. What I'm trying to say is they don't want the poor, Dalits, or the Adivasis, as we call our indigenous people, to be empowered, hmm. Hmm? to get out of the caste, uh, caste hierarchy and be seen as human beings. They are hijacking Ambedkar, hmm? the great hmm. Dalit leader, their icon. They are using Mahatma Gandhi to serve their own purpose, Sardar Patel, everybody, you know. Mm. So, one after the other, all those great symbols like the river Ganga or even the cow, and everything is being hijacked. And they are destroying these great symbols, they are destroying the great heritage. So, right now we are faced with a crisis beyond our imagination. I mean, we are, we are not prepared for it. Because they have been preparing since 1925. In 1925, their great founders of RSS were highly inspired by some of these uh, fascist forces emerging in Germany and Italy, uh, Hitler and Mussolini, etc. And their longest serving head of RSS, one Mr. Golwalkar, he writes in his books that they are our real source of inspiration. You see, mm. to that extent, and he would not trust Indian constitution or Indian flag, or they never participated in India's freedom struggle. Not one of them, not one single of them, uh, did any sacrifice. Went to jail or went to the gallows. No, but today they have appropriated this whole question of patriotism, nationalism, everything, and every day morning they get up, they want to certify everybody else, including me. They say, you are international. Whoever disagrees, their point of view of Hinduism is an international, sedition. It's an easy way to imprison, torture, maim, and do all of those things. So this is a, it's a crisis which we are faced with. And many of our people have been murdered, maimed, tortured, in prison. Unfortunately, our legal system is not able to respond to this crisis enough except here and there, the Supreme Court. But by and large, the political forces have also not been able, to, in opposition, to unite in a big way and challenge them. Mm -hmm. You know, slowly that process is emerging. But now we find that unless and until the civil society, like us, like-minded people, and the political party forces, the trade union leaders, the women's organizing, environmental movements, farmers' movement, all of us join hands and fight these dark, dark, ugly forces of obscurantism, uh, fundamentalism, and violence. Mm -hmm. There is no go. So we are trying to do that. And this is a big challenge for us. And I'm quite sure that things will change. Mm -hmm. But here lies this little, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, what I would like to suggest to the forces of religion. Normally, those who are attached to a religion say, no, politics is bad, dirty, muddy, we should not get into mm -hmm. politics. How will you bring the change? You remain a talking, talking shop. <laughs> you know, this great parliament of wealth religion where, from which I returned yesterday only in Toronto, seven days of talking shop. Talk, talk, talk. <laughs> Nothing concrete. And they are all going to be hobnobbing with the uh, powerful, uh, the politicians. I know of certain Swamis in India who are always like to be photographed with the politicians, the leaders, the Modis and everybody. And mm -hmm. they were championing peace and this and that, you know, in, in that parliament. So this is the tragedy of our times. They become, they happen to occupy that position of being religious leader, Hindu religious leader. They, but they are just the opposite of what Hinduism stands for. You know, no social justice. In their day-to-day -day life or in their actions, you will find they are doing just the opposite. Opposite. And yet, they are being given that great honor, position, award, everything, you know. Global Peace Award was given to somebody who never worked for any peace. <laughs> so, so, this is, you know, the, the religion itself is getting rotten from inside. I'm so sorry to say that. They're so pro-status quoist. They don't identify between one Hindu and the other Hindu and the other Hindu. They take, oh, Hindu? Okay. 
this is not to be done. Here I would like to point out one great Christian theologian, uh, bishop or archbishop of Latin America, inspires me most, uh, Helder Kamara. He said, when I give bread to the poor, they call me a saint. But when I ask why the poor do not have bread, they call me a communist. <laughs> that's <laughs> so right. that's the situation. No? So liberation theology. If you have anything in terms of liberating the poorest or the poor from your theology, bring that out. I did that in 1968, 69, 70. When I studied the Vedas and said, Vedic socialism, spiritual socialism is the core message of the Vedas. You know? So, but immediately uh, other superiors or elders pounced on me. So, oh, you must be a communist Marxist in disguise of a Swami. <laughs> what business has got all this rich and poor and exploitation to do with the great spiritual message of the Veda? So, ultimately I find, unless and until men of and women of faith take to politics in a more meaningful way, and politicians also imbibe some of the core spiritual values of most of all our religions, and we integrate these two, <coughs> there's no way we can bring about real social transformation in the world. Thank you, Swamiji. Um, I'd actually like to take up this, you know, um, this challenge or kind of direction you've, you've indicated on, on liberation theology. And where is it, you know, how is it, where is it emerging? Um, what is it, what forms is it taking? What is it challenging? And then what does it indicate in terms of the direction we need to go? Um, uh, Reverend Liz, maybe you could speak some to where you see some of this emerging today in the context of the United States, which mm -hmm. you know, we understand we're in a global system, but the U.S. and its particular context and role in the world gives some insight into the forms of oppression that take this kind of religious character, um, and then what what is some of the response to these, you know, whether they're the politics of fear or um, or division, or actually on the flip side, this kind of liberative. Uh, theology that, that's coming out of the struggles of the poor and dispossessed. No, I think um, there were just like a million thoughts going through my head, right, when, when, when you're, you're using these examples of, of Hindu nationalism and, and of the need for people to come together. Um, you know, where I want to start is the word evangelical. Um, if we're going to be talking about a U.S. context or we're going to be talking about a, a Christian context, right? So evangelicals um, are talked about a lot in our society today. Um, you know, folks early after Trump got into office, people were saying that he had the most evangelical cabinet in history. It's also the richest cabinet in history. Um, folks are talking after this week's election, um, the midterms, about uh, the roles that white evangelicals in particular play. Well, the word evangelical is, is from the Greek in the Bible, meaning good news. And for instance, in the Gospel of Matthew, there is not one place where evangelion, good news, isn't connected to justice, righteousness, and the ending of poverty, the release of slaves, the forgiveness of debts. I mean, you, you can't have good news, you can't have evangelism, you can't have evangelicals without having justice in the here and now, starting with the poor, justice for the poor and marginalized, right? And so, so the notion that we can have so-called evangelicals uh, in this society who are talking intolerance, who are, who are taking people's health care away, who are, are, um, are threatening people. Like, so for instance, um, I, I have the honor of co-chairing the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival with Reverend Dr. William Barber out of North Carolina. Um, Reverend Barber and I, challenged last year when um, folks were, it, well, when so-called evangelical Christians were in the White House um, laying hands on Donald Trump. And, and what we said was that how can folks pray, P-R-A-Y, hmm. for someone when that person is P-R-E-Y-ing, praying <laughs> on the poor, praying on the marginalized, praying on the other. When, when the so-called book that, that evangelicals are supposed to have at the center of their, of their 
guide and core and beliefs has 2,500 passages that's all about uplifting the poor, that's all about you know, welcoming the marginalized. It's all about erasing borders and, and walls and barriers. Um, it's all about loving people across difference. Um, and, and so, and, and from that is when actually death threats, when actual, um, uh, you know, people posting really awful things, people coming and, and threatening to do really terrible things started to happen. Um, and, and it's because we're kind of raising this question and challenging, you know, those that, um, that, uh, that, that want to go unchallenged. And uh, I mean, I think, you know, looking at the world today, right? I mean, so, so Shal, you were saying, you know, in this country, there's 140 million people who are poor and low income. You know, we've been traveling around the country, building this poor people's campaign, trying to unite and organize people. Um, spending time in Lowndes County, Alabama, where people in the 2018 in the United States um, at this moment are living with raw sewage in their yards, um, when um, parasites and, and, and infectious diseases that had been eradicated in the United States for decades and decades and decades are reemerging because of climate change and because of, of poverty, um, because of policy violence where you know, businesses get um, sanitation services, but but uh, but people don't. And these are black people, these are Latino people, these are white people, right? All in the rural South, and not just in Lowndes County, Alabama, but all in in thousands of communities like that across the country. You know, we've spent time in in Detroit, Michigan, where a hundred thousand families have had their water shut off this year um, because they can't afford to pay for water. And then what happens is that kids are taken from those families when, they, when people find out that there's no water. So teachers have to go in the first day of school, the, the second week of school, the fourth month of school, and remind the kids that they can't tell them that there's no water in their homes. They can come and take showers in the, bath, in the bathroom. They can do whatever they need, but they can't tell the teachers, the administrators of that school, that there's no water because what that will mean is that, that, that the police will come in and take those kids away just because they can't afford water. And the same water that Nestle Corporation is bottling for about $15 a year, as much water as they want, and selling it and making billions of profits. Um, and again, that's not just happening in Detroit, that's happening in North Carolina, that's happening in Pennsylvania, where kids are being removed from their families because they don't have water. There's 14 to 15 million families in this country right now as we speak who cannot afford water. I mean, this, so, so these basic, this violence that is just everywhere in this country and around the world and, 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 and killing, right? I mean, and, you know, there's more people that die in the United States from poverty and low wealth than from cancer, heart attacks, and strokes combined. But there's no national outcry. There's no international conversation about that, right? So this kind of violence that happens is justified, is upheld by a religious and Christian nationalism, and it's also upheld by, by a complete sweeping of those issues under the rug so that nobody pays any attention to it. And so that's what we're trying to do, is figure out what it looks like to unite and organize people. Um, and you can't do that if people think that their faith traditions say that you can't unite and organize. You can't do that if people think their faith traditions say that poverty and racism are inevitable. You can't do that if people think that their faith traditions um, are about pie in the sky when you die and not, and not in the here and now. Um, of a, uh, and and so, so the work that we're trying to do um, and that we see happening all across this country is kind of the work of the impossible, but it's very possible, right? So we've been doing a series of hearings across the country as the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and we've had ranchers and farmers and undocumented immigrants and homeless families and fast food workers and folks from every political spectrum, from every faith tradition, from every geographic area in this country who are all saying we're being, you know, not discriminated against equally, not oppressed equally, but we're all 
we're all not doing okay, and this has to go, and this has to give, and and it and it can give. And so, so you know, to me, uh, it's it's important for us to look at history um, and to see both the times when this kind of violence, this kind of um, pitting of people against each other are always at the highest, at, at their height, is because the possibility of people coming together at the bottom is also at its height. Um, and so it's not that we're weak. It's not that it's a bad position. It's that, that they're attacking us. They're you know, fanning the flames of racism. They're, they're, they're encouraging people to, to you know, send out pipe bombs. They're, they're saying it's okay to go in and, and, and shoot out in, in synagogues because anything um, that, that, that could have the potential of people coming together and seeing their unity and possibility and, and organizing together you know, is, is so on the verge of becoming a reality that that, that kind of violence has to be emboldened. And, and we're seeing it right now. But, but, but what we're seeing is it's because, you know, in the words of, of some brothers and sisters in South Africa, a dying mule is who kicks the hardest, right? And so um, we see a very hard kicking mule right now. Um, but it's because we have the potential across the world and in the United States of uniting people who are poor and marginalized. Thank you, um, Reverend Liz. Um, Professor Tatamanol, your scholarship um, has focused really on these questions of religion and politics and oppression and liberation as well, not just in Hinduism, but across different religious traditions. Um, what is it you know, is there a particular moment um, that's emerging right now for, if we want to talk about Hinduism, a Hindu theology of liberation, to, to really take on the questions of caste and oppression that have been built in, as you were saying, um, unjustly and unfairly, but, but to serve certain political interests? And where do you see um, these other moments, uh, you know, for the, a liberative theology, you know, um, across religions even, that... Where, where is this opportunity and possibility coming from today? I think to get at these fundamental issues, it's important to understand also the disaggregating forces that are at work in the world. And of course, mm -hmm. I think primarily, um, it's our economic practices that are fundamentally generating an imagination that pits each of us against mm -hmm. the other. Um, and the very structural forces of capitalism as practiced today are generating massive wealth inequalities, which you've already referenced. But more, um, and, and here I, we, we need to do more analysis, others have done it, um, to understand precisely how there's a kind of atomizing uh, power in our economic practices, where the, the very capacity to imagine ourselves as a collectivity is being attenuated and compromised. So in, in the midst of these atomizing, disaggregating um, powers, human beings who still are fundamentally relational creatures will find false consolation in those who promise modes of collectivity that are accomplished by pitting some against others. Mm -hmm. right. So the need for human belonging is a primary need. But if the forces that are impinging on your bodies are driving you away from others, this produces a, a, a really fraught opportunity for peddlers of false collectivity nationalism, religionism, uh, various forms of fascism, all accomplishing collectivity at the expense of some other collectivity that is rendered other. So that is the dynamic that we must address. In all our religious traditions, there are potential resources for generating larger senses of collectivity where um, we're taught to see all human beings as part of the commonwealth of God or the 
Vasudeva Kudumbam, or uh, the kingdom of God. Increasingly, we need actually to expand these notions because in many of our traditions, these conceptions of community did not extend to other earth creatures. So if anything, what we need is a deeper sense of collectivity than perhaps our traditions have had in terms of our kinship with animals and with plants and trees and, and with the whole earth family. But it's precisely at, that, at, at this moment that we, we're seeing a, uh, the generation in a variety of countries of what Stanley Samartha, uh, no, no, it was not Samartha, uh, Stanley Tambia, who uh, called uh, majorities with a minority complex. Majorities with a minority complex. That's what Hindutva is doing in India. That's what Christian national, white Christian nationalism is doing in America. It's saying to white majorities here, you are threatened by them. An invasion is coming. I mean, this is Trump's discourse that this caravan from Honduras created structurally by US forces. Uh, we can give an analysis of the conditions under which Honduras was destabilized. And that story is one where we're at fault. Right? Nonetheless, these people are being depicted as um, a violent caravan of, of brown people. But in that sea of brown people, there are Middle Easterners, which is, of course, a token for Islamophobia. And, of course, that discourse is precisely the discourse that was used by the, the shooter at the Tree of Life synagogue. So a direct line of connection can be drawn between Trump's discourse and the, sh and the shooting that took place. So this is the condition under which religion has, religious institutions have a choice. Function to sanctify particular identities at the expense of other particular identities, and religious traditions have always done that, or remind human beings that if the point of religious life is to be oriented towards mystery, that the human being is what he or she longs for, what they long for. If I am what I long for, and what I long for is mystery, then what I am is itself mystery. And my particular identities, though precious, are, to use the Hindu <coughs> discourse, vyavaharika, they're conventional realities. But underneath all my conventional identities, there is a mystery. That mystery is the face of the other, as well as the mystery that is deeply within me. And if religious traditions do not cultivate this intuition and sensibility for mystery, but reify our identities and make the Vyavaharika Paramartaka, to use Hindu discourse, we're in big trouble. Um, yes, the, the challenges um, of this moment are so present and deep and dark. Um, and yet, I think all of us here are connected to a light, you know, um, of hope and resistance that is breaking through. Um, in this moment, kairos actually means, uh, you know, uh, a break in time. There is chronological time, and then kairos is a break in time. It's a moment of crisis, but also a moment of opportunity. Um, so as we kind of close our, our time together today, I'd invite you all to speak to some, some moment of light and opportunity that we can, that we look at and turn to um, in the times of darkness, not to, not, to not, not to back away from the darkness, but to know that we are not alone. We are building those communities. These communities are emerging. And what is it about them that, that we must hold dear and precious and, and, um, and commit ourselves to? I think this point of history, it's a great, great opportunity. <clears throat> we should consider this to be a great blessing of our times. The forces of globalization, however much they are doing some very destructive work, are also giving us an opportunity to come closer, nearer. The technology is helping us in a big, big way. The internet and the social media and all of those things. This is time to forge real alliance across countries, nationalities, religions, 
every divide, every divide which has been hitherto used to disempower the poor deliberately. That we should call the bluff, that this was artificially uh, articulated and uh, we don't agree, we don't accept it. So we should say that anything which divides us as human family is non, uh, non, un unacceptable. Huh? And the whole of humanity, one family, and in the family it is the youngest child who needs, uh, the weakest person in the family who needs protection, care, affection first. That means the poorest of the poor need to be taken care of. With that philosophy of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, if we can forge an alliance, this is the time we can do it. It can be done, number one. For that, we need to transcend that narrow religion, religiosity in which we are born into or we have been practicing or institutionalized religions, etc. And also try to politicize it in that larger context. I'm not saying this national uh, politics, but the human politics. Earth belongs to us all, equal. Hmm? We say in our Sanskrit, uh, Mother Earth, Bhumi Mata. And if Earth is our mother and we are all its equal children, then all the resources of the Earth belong equally to us. We cannot allow in the name of globalization, privatization of natural resources for profit. It should stop. No? People cannot be displaced to hand over their land and mineral wealth to some corporates to exploit. It's happening worldwide. And so on and so forth. And we should raise these voices together with progressive political forces and other forces in a big way so that we are loud and clear, we are heard. And we should mean business. That we should protest on the streets, just not hide behind the screens and say goody-goody things. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, we should be ready to uh, stand up and be counted. That means uh, to face whatever persecution it entails. So this way, I think a new form of religious, social, spiritual activism is the need of the hour to forge that alliance. And we must be very absolutely clear about gender equality. Gender equality whatever obtains in your scripture, religion, practice, dogma, inequality, not acceptable. Gender equality, non-negotiable. Simple, one word. Whoever is on this side of this line, we, we are together. Other side, maybe our own kith and kin or religious community, no. So, this way we need to uh, create some sort of a new bonding. I think the poor, by and large, they need this empowerment. You should tell them, this God is one, and God does not divide us. And kingdom of God means we are all equal, just as the sun shines equally on all, without discrimination. The air we are breathing is equal for all. The raindrops are equal for all, not a single leaf of any tree discriminates on grounds of gender or caste or rich or poor, nothing black or white, you know. So this is the message, spiritual message that nature is giving, the universe is giving us and that should help us to be spiritually and also to be politically empowered. If this could be done and Kairos can play a very, very important role, shall we? <laughs> Explore all your forces and let's join hands. And Liz and John, and we are all together with you. But the message has to go down. Unfortunately, the mainstream media, which has been captured, bought over, you know, they, they are uh, not allowing this message to go across. And that's the challenge we need to face. It should go to the youth, even to the kids and to the poor who are struggling to make two square meals a day or something like that. They are the produce, producers of the wealth, and yet they are the poorest of the poor. That's right. So this is what we need to answer, and therefore, I think 
I'm not at all pessimistic. I am very hopeful that as the days are proceeding, you find contradictions within the system. The inner contradiction itself will throw up new opportunities. The climate change crisis, as, as it is, you know, it's emerging. But it's saying that we are all one, you know. <laughs> so this way, there are many other things. The economic uh, situation is also crying for coming together. As rightly pointed out by you, it's hardly 1% of the people who are controlling 99% of all wealth. Mm -hmm. huh? Three people here in the U.S. controlling so much of wealth. Hmm? The Bejos and of Amazon, and they are talking about going to the Mars. Mm. For them, the planet goes to rot. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. So what is this? The planet belongs to us. This is our home. Yeah, Earth right. is our home. We cannot run away from it. So we need to assert our right to equality and against all forms of injustice, racial, caste, gender, economic, everything. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Sure. Um, yeah, I actually feel um, both inspired by that and, and hopeful by what I'm seeing happen across this country and across this world. Um, you know, in your opening, shall you talked a little just bit give about... give me one minute, you yeah. know, just excuse me. That's good. The real question to be addressed is, immediately after the Second World War and all that catastrophe, the mm -hmm. wise people came together and they forged one document called the Human Rights Declaration and the UN was given birth to. Unfortunately, UN, instead of becoming the real instrument of change, ended up being a club of 193 so-called sovereign nation states. That's right. And nobody takes uh, I mean, seriously whatever the UN conventions or whatever, whatever. They are beautiful. UN has got a beautiful structure worldwide, everything, but they don't have the authority to implement their own mandate. Now, this is the time when we should ask these nation states why in the name of your defense system or armaments, etc., you are spending one trillion seven hundred billion dollars annually, one trillion seven hundred billion dollars annually on armaments, on defense system. Mm -hmm. A mere ten percent reduction can wipe out all poverty and all of these That's things, right. and you can achieve each one of those seventeen uh, sustainable development goals. There are no resources. But reduce this armament race by 10%. Or ultimately, if you have a world government and world parliament and earth constitution, with 10%, you can manage all the defense of the whole of humanity, and you can save 90%. So <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. No, that's <laughs> right. It's right. I mean, so one of the things that we, 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 we learned um, as we pulled together the Souls of Poor Folk audit for, for the Poor People's Campaign um, this year um, so that we could kind of inform the demands that people were coming up with um, was that, you know, just in the United States alone, we spend 53 cents um, of every discretionary dollar on the military, but less than 15 cents on mm -hmm. education and health care and poverty programs, right? And so, so <coughs> you can see both uh, how across the world the priorities are wrong and then how in each sovereign nation state they're, they're wrong um, and that they don't prioritize life, they don't pr prioritize, you know, livelihood. Um, and so, so, I mean, I think that's, that's so important and, and, and therefore why we need something where movements and people of the world can come together, you know, exchange our experiences and, and, and s construct what what needs to be the priority of, of, of lifting people up and, and putting the earth and people first, you know, and, and, and all of these things. Um, and I think that that doesn't happen, as you were saying before, just through talk. Um, you know, I think it, it has to, ha you know, new ideas and new talk comes out of action, right? And, and so I think in terms of when we're talking about this, like, light that we see, I mean, when, 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 uh, when, when people across 42 states in the United States and in Washington, D.C. this past spring engaged in the largest wave of nonviolent civil disobedience um, in this country's history 
um, that 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 was a huge you know beam of light um, and in fact it was lots of beams of light because it wasn't just happening one place it wasn't just happening amongst one group of people it wasn't just around one issue it was trying to draw the connections between you know, uh, systemic racism and poverty and ecological devastation, this climate change crisis and, and militarism and this war economy, and then this distorted moral narrative of, of, of religious nationalism and how all of those come together to kind of um, keep everybody down. But when we kind of come together across those differences and with those issues at the core of what we're doing um, and, and uh, take action together. So, I mean, one of the things that's been really inspiring to us has been, you know, the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, who in 1968 said that the poor and dispossessed live in a cruelly unjust society. If they can be helped to take action together, they will do so with a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. Um, and I don't think that's actually just a complacent complacent national life. I think it's, 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 a, it's a global international life. Um, because uh, you know what what we're seeing is that 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 right now the issues that impact people the majority of the time um, are not the issues that there's a, a international discussion on, um, and also that right now if you're talking about uh, where are poor people and young people and, and marginalized people and oppressed people, most people are kind of over to the side and disorganized and not coming together in, in, in real ways. And so, so to, to, to put out the, the potential and possibility of what it looks like when people you know, unite and organize across all of these lines of difference, um, because again, it's happening. And, and, and how that shakes up society, how that shifts the narrative, how that builds power amongst people, not power that that is used to destroy communities and, and to embolden racists, but, but power that, that has the potential to say that, that folks should have health and health care and folks should have food and nutrition and folks should have education and there should be, a, you know, that uh, discrimination, discrimination is non-negotiable. We can't, we have to have equal protection to the law. We have to have equal rights. We can't have, you know, anybody being marginalized. I mean, the, those those demands come out of not just good thoughts, not just good rhetoric, but out of people coming together across lines and saying, you know, what are the solutions to the problems we're having? And, and then how are we going to build the power and the unity across global lines? How are we going to learn from movements all across the world? How are we going to learn from faith traditions all across the world? And, and, and bring out that together into something that's beautiful and powerful. And, and again, I, I, I see that happening. I see that not as nice rhetoric, not as like a good idea, not as just some people sitting around and, and sharing, but I see like, you know, this kind of moral revolution of values actually happening mm -hmm. um, and happening in the United States and happening when I, when I get to travel globally and when I get to even more so learn from folks who are, are you know, struggling and organizing and building, you know, transformative movements all, all across the world. And so, I mean, I think there's, you know, one of the things that Dr. King also said in the last, you know, speech of his life is that it's when the, the sky is at its darkest is when you can see it's the stars. And, and so I, I think these are dark times. These are dangerous times. These are violent times. And you can see these stars and lights of, of hope and peace and justice. Um, again, not just as beautiful ideas, not as pretty words, but as people in struggle in communities, you know, waging a different life together um, all over the world. Good. It's just beautiful to hear these two. It's, uh, again, what they speak come from embodied courage. And it's uh, particularly delightful to hear um, the Swami cite, uh, the, cite capitalist notions of the internal uh, ruptures of capitalism <laughs> and uh, cite the liberation theologians of Latin America. You would have thought that the union professor would be the one doing that, but I don't need to because he's already done it. Uh, so I'll do something that he might have, we, we might expect him to do. I'm actually encouraged that there is a new turn to attention to 
questions of nonviolence, um, both in terms of this particular year, which, uh, which in India and globally is marking the 150th anniversary of the birth of Gandhi. So that's one impulse. But one finds also that the recent Gifford lectures by Judith Butler were dedicated to nonviolence. So both in secular contexts as well as religious contexts, there is a sense that you cannot accomplish nonviolent ends by violent means. Mm. That there must be a congruency between means and ends. Mm. And that wisdom is among the crucial bits of wisdom that I think we have to cultivate. Um, and we have to mobilize the power of, of, of nonviolent thinking and living and pit it against uh, the politics of nostalgia, this longing for some pristine age uh, in the past which never existed when all was good. I mean, this is mere Archie Bunkerism, you know. Uh, those were the days, right? We have an Archie Bunker president uh, mobilizing around violence, rhetorical violence, um, and a, a, a hope for return to certain forms of white supremacy, which are steeped in violence, <coughs> while naming those violent activities and rhetoric for what they are, we must cultivate within ourselves the spiritual capacities. And I must tell you that <laughs> I'm an amateur still. This, the spiritual capacities to recognize that our enemies, too, are the beloved of God, mm. including the ones we name, um, whose actions we hold to accountability. That is a spiritual challenge of the first order. Uh, and this is particularly why we need the deepest resources of our traditions. Now, if we need the resources of those traditions, we do have to reclaim them from, from, from those persons who claim to speak for our traditions. So Hinduism must be reclaimed from Hindutva. Christianity must be reclaimed from uh, Franklin Graham and Jerry Falwell Jr. Mm -hmm. really and, uh, and another vision must be articulated, one that's proper to our traditions. And I do agree that some of that vision, in fact, <laughs> the largest bit of it, come from the marginalized, from those who say um, no, from those who, to use the language of uh, liberation theology, exercise the epistemological privilege of the poor, because they're in a position to see how the system is set up against them. Um, so I'm encouraged by the remarkable work of black women in this country, uh, Stacey Abrams being a particularly fine embodiment. I'm deeply encouraged by the Parkland students who mobilized so uh, s stunningly against the NRA. So the voices of the youth, the voices of the marginalized, who are telling us uh, that there is another way into the future for, for ourselves and for our traditions does give me hope. Well, thank you all um, for this uh, discussion today. Um, I, you know, I've, I was raised Hindu and these questions of Hindu liberation um, are very kind of personal and meaningful to me as I've also been part of building this campaign here in the United States and see it as connected to the broader um, liberation from oppression and violence that, that we so need um, everywhere. And you know, as you know, this week millions of Hindus around the world celebrated Diwali. Uh, many would have offered prayers to the goddess Lakshmi, who is most celebrated as, as the goddess of wealth. But her four arms represent more than just wealth. Um, they represent um, Wealth, yes, but also dharma, you know, uh, morality. They represent kama, love, and they represent moksha, liberation. And to have them all in one being means that you can't separate one of those from the other. You can't have well-being without liberation. You can't have love without morality. You can't have morality without well-being. All of these come together. 
And so um, I'd just like to offer a short prayer um, in the spirit of the liberation that we're seeking and building towards um, to Lakshmi, honoring the whole of what, represent, whole of what she represents as we all seek the, the lights of resistance and hope in these dark times that are illuminating everywhere. Om Jai Lakshmi, um, goddess born from the struggle between good and evil, guide us toward the light. In a world where plenty is possible, let us end hunger, thirst, homelessness, and oppression. In your nurturing hands, let us seek refuge from want, fear, and violence. With your grace, let our world be reborn in your image, where all needs are met, where morality and love are abundant, and whereby we are free. Om Jai Lakshmi. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Right. May I, as a gesture yeah. of solidarity, right. give you two books? Yes. Yeah. One is this Applied Spirituality, in which I have awesome. tried to analyze my ideas, working among the poorest of the poor in India. Another is more important, what I was speaking about, the world revolution through world law. Mm. Huh? That means Earth Federation mm. and Earth Constitution mm. and the World Parliament. Yeah. Dr. Glenn T. Martin is our president. I am part of this whole movement worldwide. Mm. And we have drafted Earth Constitution. And we are moving towards a world parliament. And all citizens of the world are global citizens. Mm. And we have a fundamental right to move from one to the other to the other country. Just as the business people have a right to move their goods and there and there, we have a right to move human persons. So, mm. no immigration, no all of these That's right. restrictions. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's so awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.